Living in New York City is expensive and sometimes it can be challenging to afford even the basic necessities such as clothing and furniture. Did you know that you may be eligible for funding to help offset the cost of certain items for your loved one with an intellectual or developmental disability? The Family Reimbursement Program at Adapt Community Network is here to help. Give us a call today at 1-877-827-2666 to see if you qualify. Hello, I am Barbara Edson, a Family Resource Coordinator with ADAPT Community Network, and it is my pleasure to moderate the panel discussion, Parent Advocacy, now more important than ever. Advocacy has been an important topic in the disabilities field, and it continues to be the driving force behind change. Today, we have five incredible individuals, Ellie Rufer, Cabano Di Rosario, Kim Madden, Pana Poto, Paula Jordan, who felt a need, acted upon that need, and became engaged as advocates. Their backgrounds are diverse, and the disabilities that they are familiar with are also diverse, but their goal is a common one. Come together to advocate and initiate change. They have faced many hurdles to achieve success, but they never stop their fight, and I know they never will. Advocacy has become a necessity for them, as it is a necessity for all of those who are part of the special needs community. Let us now meet these highly respected individuals. Hi, my name is Ellie Rufer, and I've been an advocate since uh, my daughter was diagnosed at eight months. So she's turning 40, so I've been at this a long time. I am the co-founder of NYC FAIR, and I am a parent co-chair of the Manhattan DD Council. Thank you. Kirbana, would you share with us, please? Hi, my name is Kirbana Di Rosario, and I became a self-advocate when my son had a medical accident at birth. I am uh, actively uh, also a co-parent co-chair at QCDD, and I work with an uh, organization connecting families with special needs. Thank you, Paula. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself? My name is Paula Jordan. I'm a parent of twins, 13 year old going 14. Both of them have uh, access to special education services. I'm also an aunt to two wonderful niece and nephew who are also autistic. And I'm the co-director of the Metropolitan Parent Center at Synergia, one of the federal funded parent centers that provide support and services for families in New York City. Thank you. Kim, would you share with us, please? Sure, I'm Kim Madden, I'm the parent of Owen, who's 18, uh, quadriplegic, uses augmentative communication to communicate, and he's in a six-year program at a New York City public high school. I'm also the director of family support at Advocates for Children of New York. Thank you. And Pana, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Pana Poto. I'm the parent of two children who also receive special education services. One of them is 14 and the other is five. And I'm the manager of parent and family engagement on our early childhood team at Include NYC. And last but not least, I'm also the co-founder of a, parent, a Bronx Parent Support Group for families of children on the autism spectrum. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Um, let's begin. My first question to the panel has two parts. What is advocacy to you and how did you become an advocate? Who would like to start? I can start. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so for me, advocacy means speaking up, not being afraid to really get out there and say what's on your mind. It also means being informed and knowing your rights so you know what to advocate for and how to advocate. I became an advocate when my son was diagnosed with autism. So he went all through early intervention. I had no idea what autism was. Nobody told me anything about autism services and how to get him what he needed. He kind of just coasted through early intervention. And it wasn't until he was transitioning to kindergarten that I started finding out about all these services and supports that he could have gotten. And so I said to myself, I don't want other parents to go through their journey uninformed like I was back then. And that kind of, it got me started on this journey to being an advocate and not only being able to help my children, but to be able to help other families and children as well. 
Thank you. Does anybody else have something to share? Advocacy, self-advocacy means talking up for yourself and then being able to talk for another parent. Uh, how did I begin? I didn't realize I was advocating for my child when I was speaking out, trying to get him what he needed. Uh, my son got therapy at the age of 16 days. And I only realized then that I was talking out for them. And uh, when he joined preschool and early intervention, and I got augmentative devices for him and durable equipment. I got parents coming forth and asking me, how did you and where did you get it from? And went forward helping others. And that's how I got involved with the system and stayed in. Yeah, advocacy for us always starts with our own child and, and getting what they need to make them healthy, happy, and as productive as possible. Um, the, the idea, the real idea of advocacy to me, the core is to share whatever information that we have okay. and that you have to um, join others and keep exchanging information and ideas and you just grow, it just grows and, you know, join everything. <laughs> Paula, you're shaking your head in agreement, I believe. Absolutely. The difference is that as an immigrant, when I arrive in this country, I had to become an advocate for myself. So I had to start navigating the city, the country, the laws, regulations, immigration. And when I thought that the job was done, right, I become a parent and I had this surprise that um, my kids need help. So for me, that's when I become an advocate, right? I, I, it was a transferable skill that I'm pretty sure hundreds of families that are going to be seeing this can relate to that, especially in migrant families, that when we come here to this country, you need to start developing a certain set, set of tools, right? One of them is communication, um, using facts, right? Factual information, be able to communicate and be able to navigate different circumstances, especially when there is around conflict. So to become an advocate at this level where I feel right now I am in my life, is that I'm able to continue doing this not only for my kids and my family, but also for the families that come to our parent center and we're able to provide that support and that guidance. Thank you. Kim, I don't wanna leave you out. Would you like to uh, give us your opinion and your thoughts on advocacy right now? Well, I think that uh, everyone else on this panel has really said it so well. The only thing that I would add, and I think it's to echo how Pana started in terms of you have to understand and learn about the system that you're advocating to change first. Um, and I think what Paula just said too is uh, trying to think systemically about it. So when you start thinking not just, you, you certainly have to advocate for what your child needs. And I think uh, what's made me the strongest as an advocate professionally is my personal experience because I understand what it feels like to go up against these bureaucracies, how little information you really have or how much misinformation you have and when you need to push back and when you know you might need to learn more about what you're trying to change. Um, but I do think thinking systemically uh, and thinking about the world you want your child to live in is what helps us be advocates for our families and for other families like ours. Thank you, thank you all for sharing. Uh, my next question is, how and where do you begin as an advocate? What are the first steps that one might take once one decides to become an advocate? You don't decide to become an advocate at all. It just, if you're taking care of your family, you are an advocate for your family. And then you just um, play it over for other people because whatever you learn has to be important to someone else, has to. And the idea of uh, improving the situation is very complex and you need other people to help figure it out. Um, who to blame, you know, why you're not getting what you need. But you don't make a conscious decision, I'm gonna become an advocate. In no, my, I think that's in my right. Opinion. Yeah, and I think the scary part as a parent is I realize I remember uh, my son has a complex neuromuscular disability, uh, originally just going to so many experts. And at some point you start realizing you know more than a lot of the experts. And that's kind of a horrifying moment. Certainly about your own child. <laughs> yeah. And so I think 
that's when, you, of course, you have to be an advocate. And when you start understanding the system better, I learned that all the time as a professional. I didn't understand middle and high school applications anywhere near as well when I was doing trainings on them before I went through them as a parent and living it just, it gives you a really different perspective. Right. Paula, would you like to uh, chime in? You're shaking your head, yes. You know, the, it is so uh, interesting to hear other perspectives because when I got my kids, I was going through the motions, right? And suddenly I realized that it's gonna be a difficult delivery and they were preemies. And when I realized that I was in a situation where I did not have no one, no peer model, no family, no one here, I realized that I needed to do something about it. And that's mean to not feel intimidated to be in, within the medical component, right? I'm Latina. We have very different approach in our countries. Like when you respect the authority and they tell you what to do and you don't question that, that was probably one of the biggest um, aspects that I had to struggle internally in terms of feeling comfortable under my own skin to be able to speak up, right? At the beginning, with a lot of emotions, and it fractured a lot of relationships. And mm -hmm. later on, I learned with experience and with good peer model that I was very fortunate to have in my life that uh, it's not going to take you nowhere. So I learned through, you know, the, the experiences, painful experiences, how to reshape uh, my voice and be able to do this in, in a better way. Thank you so much. Paula mentioned... Um, Having a role model, did any of you have a mentor when you began uh, your journey as a advocate? And where would one find a, a mentor? I, I just wanted to uh, say something on what Paula said. Even I came in as an immigrant, but I brought, I came with a nine month old. So it was a different journey mm -hmm. and I came because I had to give up my job and I had to give up everything and I was willing to follow my husband and let him work. <laughs> and it was very difficult emotionally and physically to not be an earning member and be in, an independent human being where I thought, what I thought was independent. And like Paula said, it was a foreign world and I began the journey on my own. So I did not have even a mentor or a friend to confide in. And I was just blessed because the school I went to supported my goals. And, you know, in earlier days, we didn't have to go for early intervention. We went into a school and said, you want help? And you got help. And if you were blessed with a good school, you got it. But the journey is very difficult. And it's very, uh, it's the same for all of us, but it's very difficult as an immigrant and speaking a different body language. Yeah. So I never had a mentor. I just had a fabulous support system that I just picked up along the way. Well, you had a community of mentors then. Yeah, I was very blessed. You know that in my case, I got an invitation in the mail uh, because my kids start early intervention, especially my boy at uh, six weeks old. And I got an uh, invitation to be part of a training that is um, mm -hmm. uh, provided by the Department of Health. And I never thought that going to that training was going to change my life. I was able to find a mentor and friends. Uh, but the surprise part is that uh, my mentor, um, she was a white woman. She shared her white privilege and she shared her knowledge. And she did it with hundreds of families in New York State. She was one of the most influential, influential person in the state to my goodness, to advance early intervention. Unfortunately, she passed away a couple of years ago and uh, it's still painful just to think about the, the, the whole, the gap that we have without her because I'm part of the whole generation of new parents that we're exploring this. I, I never was really thinking through the lens of having a mentorship with someone that looks like me as a Latino Spanish speaking parent, but I hope that with the seed that she was able to plant on us Right now, we're going to see a more diverse group of parents who are willing to provide their support to the next generation and, and be generous with their time, generous with the knowledge, generous with their grace, because this is not easy. So I, I think this panel today is a good example of that. 
So I want to add to that. For me, it's kind of similar to what we've already said here. I've had more of a community <laughs> of mentors. I've learned so much from other parents. You know, uh, when parents experience something good, when they experience something bad, we always share with each other and we learn from what benefits each other and we learn from each other's mistakes. So I'll give a quick example of a mistake. I remember when I was, re I was renewing my son's Medicaid and back then we had Medicaid service coordinators and she told me, oh, just complete the form and put it in the mail. So I went and put all my income and everything. And of course I, he, my son was denied and I ended up at a fair hearing. I didn't know that I had to submit in additional information to show that he was getting services through the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities. Yeah. So, they, so they would not look at income. And that was one mistake. That was one time and that was, the, and every time after that, I knew exactly what to do. And I made sure every parent I knew who was renewing Medicaid knew exactly what to put in that envelope to renew their child's Medicaid. So we learn from each other. We learn from each other's mistakes. And I think there's a lot of value in that, that, that parent community. I think it really, really has a lot of value. Here's a plug to bring back site-based EI. Um, absolutely. Katie is turning 40, so for 39 years, um, I'm friends with the families that we met in EI when Kate was eight months old. You know, so, um, and we continue to, to this day to share everything that's going on and all the information. So um, we need to put back some of the services that have disappeared. Yeah, I that's agree our that. advocacy goal at this point. EI, it's really sad because I'm sure for all of us, that's where you, if you know, sometimes some parents start later, obviously, right. but wherever you start, and a lot of us start in EI, it is such a tough road, and you're trying to learn a whole language while dealing with a whole lot of emotions and all of that. And it's, you know, it should be a, a much more supportive system. Um, I feel like it was still pretty supportive when we started, although it was beginning to crumble. I actually became, I was an attorney, I am an attorney and was an advocate for legal services for the elderly, very different population. I love to fight, you know, for civil poverty law. And then I hit this system and I was like, oh, this is one of those where <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to get in and untangle it. And my introduction was having to sue early intervention about something really stupid and being intimidated out of my lawsuit by somebody in EI who said, well, you, we might give you that, but we're going to move your son from where he is close to your house to we could send him to a center base in Queens. And I was like, I can't have my two-year-old on a bus for two hours. And I was terrified. And so it was a really kind of a rude awakening to what it can be like. But I do think those early years are where you learn so much and um, where we all make a lot of mistakes, right? I, I did the same thing with Medicaid. I didn't know that, Pana. Sure. <laughs> Everybody does, right? We all did. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing, I, I just did another thing that I thought was funny is I once had a neurologist connect me with another parent um, where we had children with similar, really rare genetic mutations. And it took me a while to realize, I think he connected us so that, because we were such a pain in the neck to him, <laughs> asking him and pushing, and he at least bought some time by, getting us to connect and, and talk to each other instead of him. <laughs> my neurologist put me together with Margaret Puddington. Oh Just God. saying, <laughs> speaking of mentors. <laughs> That's awesome. Terrific. Thank you so much for sharing all of that great um, background info. Um, can would anyone like to speak about the challenges that you faced as an advocate? Because it certainly is a very challenging situation. I think like Kautna said, uh, you face challenges as you take on each new project for your child. You're always doing a new project. At least I have never finished. My son's now 31. And every time I have to get him a durable equipment, it's the same equipment that I needed when he was six and when he was three. But today I'm doing his wheelchair evaluation again, and it's like pulling out the few hair that are left on my head, and it's really <laughs> tough. And it's a challenge at every single step that you have to fight for the big wheel, the small wheel, the brake, the side panels, you know, and for everything. And as they grow older, I find it's tougher because you don't have the backing of the schools 
And then when there's a different level of advocacy that starts. I think Ellie will understand that. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the real challenge is to get heard. As, you know, not as that, that the parent, the pain in the parent, you know, but as someone who actually uh, can help everything. I think the real trick for all of us is to figure out who, who is to blame, you know, the, with, it's not the provider necessarily, it's not the school necessarily. It, if they don't have enough money to do, provide what you need, you need to figure out how to advocate for that also. So it's just extrapolating on getting what you need and then figuring out why you're not getting it and then advocating to the people who can actually make a difference, which is unfortunately government. And Money. you know, one thing I would add to that too is in addition to all the systemic issues, I think as parents, especially parents of younger children, we cannot afford to be complacent because the older advocates ahead of us, they, they fought. <laughs> a lot of the services and supports that we have now is because the generation before us fought for those services. So we take a lot for granted and I think we, we become complacent. So when we see those emails, make calls to Albany, do this, do that, we kind of ignore them. But I think it's really important for us to continue to stay engaged because advocacy never ends. I think it was Ellie who said that the last time. It doesn't end. There's always going to be a new battle to fight. There's always something. If it's not the school bus, if it's not the waiver services, if it's not transportation, it's always something. And so just when we get over one hurdle, is another. it's another hurdle. And it starts really early, from early intervention all the way up. So we definitely cannot give up and we just have to keep fighting. And it sounds cliche, but it's literally true because if you sit back and you don't fight, there could be some service or support that your child can really benefit from that they're not gonna get. And, and that is connected with the burnout as parents because it's not just about our kids. They're not part of something bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Us that we have extended family in other countries, that's another component. That's another piece of the situation that we have, right? And what point are you gonna say, I need to make a stop and recharge? And I think that's one of the biggest challenge that I'm seeing, especially during COVID, where we are really uh, reaching bottom, many of us. And who's to blame here? No one. No it's one. part of the circumstances, right? And what are we gonna do next? So it's, it's when you feel that you need to put aside the time to think about yourself, that's when you see things happening. And as Pan is saying, like, if we don't take action and pick up the phone and start advocating and really understand why we are advocating for, what is all this job is gonna go to, right? So it's a circle, it's a completely circle that it, we, I don't know you guys, but I feel sometimes I'm in that wheel, right? Like the constant reaching the point of burnout and then realizing we cannot give up right now because there is so much that needs to be doing. And right now we're going through a transition in generations. We have the pioneers who are retiring. Unfortunately, many are passing away. Let's gonna see what was the impact of COVID in, in, in thousands of families in New York City. What about us, right? What is our moral and social responsibility to continue advancing the rights for people with disabilities in the state? I think that is the, the biggest challenge that I'm seeing right now in my personal life and working with families is like, how are we going to keep alive that engagement that is going to be meaningful, intentional, that even if you have time to make one phone call, that one phone call is going to, is going to create the necessary effect that we need collectively. So I, I think that that's something that we're taking it for granted, right, as well. Hey, we have all this amount of people with disabilities in, in New York State. That doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's at the same level in terms of understanding the system, understanding the history. We need to take a moment to teach this history to the new generation of parents. We cannot take for granted that you know this, we don't. So I, I think that's, that's probably the biggest challenge. I think that's right. And to make sure we're not going backwards. I mean, I was listening to Curvanu. I have the same thing with the BME fight right now that is exhausting me to my soul. And it's it, literally recreating the wheel, recreating the wheelchair every whatever, however many years you get to fight with your insurance company. Um, and it's, it's exhausting. Um, but I do think the history is so important. I think one of the systemic change things that I think about all the time as a parent of a, a, 
um, young man who's, you know, will be aging out of school soon is the fact that it does sometimes feel like, oh, it's a system that's existed and we're just navigating it. But what you all are saying about this is a path that has been beaten down by, you know, the generation just in front of Ellie. And I look to Ellie all the time for, wow, before that it was Willowbrook. Like yeah. I try to think yeah. about, and I, you know, I think that is really important. Teaching the history of Willowbrook, honestly, especially from some of the things I've heard recently. There's tremendous it's, amount of inv inv um, information about Willowbrook on the Staten Island DD Council's website, explaining how it got there and what happened and what, how it's beginning to circle around again. Yeah, and making sure that people who are not part yeah. of our community understand that, that the community understands it as a whole. My biggest hope with COVID was people would understand need and isolation and how we rely on each other. I'm not so sure uh, that that was right, uh, but I hope that you know there is something where we can teach everyone about uh, the history of our community collectively from a systemic way of look at what happened in nursing homes. You can't, come on, there, obviously there's a better way. There's lots of ideas, but the way it trickles out in, through the bureaucracy is, is not great. And I think there's such an opportunity for teaching ourselves, but also teaching more broadly about uh, this fight. Thank you. Um Several of you have just mentioned COVID. Um, how did being an advocate serve you during this pandemic? And uh, what role do you see you'll have post-pandemic? Hopefully we'll get out of this uh, situation soon. I, I, um, COVID was very dramatic for me. Uh, I took my daughter home from her residence to give, well, a couple of reasons, to give staff a break so that they could use, have half the amount of staff in the house in case someone got COVID, you know, staffing is the problem at the moment. And then seven months into her staying with me, I said, you know, it's time to go back. <laughs> Can't stay here forever. I'm 75 years old. And um, she said, I'm not going. Said, what do you mean you're not going? She said, I, I, I'm not going, I'm scared I'm gonna have a seizure on the steps. It was in a townhouse. And I said, okay, we'll find you a residence without steps. And I had to switch providers and go to the, the, the DDRO. Um, and because I knew the steps that you had to, to go through with the state, she's in a new residence. So, um, would it have happened to anyone who didn't understand the system as well? Probably not as within the time frame. So COVID hit everyone. Everyone. The deaths of men. Never mind. You know that at the Parent Center, we had the opportunity to be part of conversations that were happening at the Department of Education level where they were in this urgent need to bring this information to families. When we realized how, like, how the impact of lack of access to technology, simple things as an internet, simple things as a learning how to use uh, uh, the computer or to use your email account for thousands of families in New York City, especially underserved families. And for us to be seen as a credible messenger within our community, yeah. I think that was one of the biggest um, uh, roles, positive roles that we were able to see uh, supporting families in the, in, in, here in the city. But moving forward, yes, we, we're continuing elevating the same needs of families. I'm hearing more and more, oh, let's gonna send everything via uh, email. That is not gonna work for a small percentage of the community. And I think it's our role to continue mentioned that and advocating that we need to provide different access to information. And when we're thinking about school age kids, let's think about that is over 200,000 students with IEPs in the city of New York. Is everybody getting the information at the same time? No, but we need to make sure that we are saying that you need to have different mechanisms to do that. And to tap into reliable messengers in the community, advocates, leaders, uh, community-based organizations to enhance that job. So that's how I can tell you that we were able to see that. We were able to contact 
hundreds of families. We pick up the phone and we contact families. How are you doing? And we learned that the, their priorities shift during the spike of the pandemic. There was yeah. not education a priority. They were literally, families were scared. People were sick. People were dying. They were hungry. Housing insecurity. It doesn't mean that everything is fine working with the, the Department of Education and the kids were getting the services. It means that the priorities shift and we were able to really yeah. highlight that. Personally, the pandemic affected me also because my son was in a residence, like Ellie said, but I didn't have, I was not able to bring him home. I can't physically look after him 24 uh seven. -huh. So it was very difficult to even think about it, but um, I was blessed that the residents looked after him medically and he was fine and he's okay today. But while I was watching this, I was doing parent support groups while I was working and the stories that came out emotionally really rocked my boat. It's okay for us. We as parents are advocates for our children and we have some parents that we educate and learn from us and we learn from them. But there's so many of our kids who don't have that support, who don't have the support. And I see it more with the older kids. I had self-advocates who came onto my parent support groups and were looking for help. And I feel that they really, really get lost in the system. Like nothing to do with the pandemic. Like when they want oh, to equipment, they do not get it. I've heard like even a speech device is not given to them because now they don't know how to use it, but you didn't know that they did know how to use it in school. So give them a chance to use it, but they won't get a special piece of equipment because they're lost in the system. There's nobody to advocate for them. Yeah, I would say, you know, advocacy during the pandemic meant different things to me. I mean, of course I had to continue to make sure that my children got their services, but I do agree that priorities shifted. People, like we were trying to survive. <laughs> yeah. So if we miss speech one day, it's not the end of the world, as right. long as my family is safe. And I also, through my work at Include NYC, we were also trying to support families. But I'll admit to you all, it was hard because my family experienced loss also. We had family member, you know, a, a family member who had who had COVID and recovered. So it's like, while we're trying to support families, we're also dealing with our own issues at the same time. And that there's that vicarious trauma as well, because you're being triggered every single day. Right. And so being able to push past all of that, it was a lot, it was a lot. Um, but, you know, it really helped me just knowing, I, I found it therapeutic being able to help other people as well. So there's also that, that part of it. And I also want to bring up something as well. There's a whole new group of people that are going to need advocacy because of long COVID. Right. So they're experiencing some disabilities that they never had before. They're, they're experiencing some conditions and some health concerns, including children. And there are whole, there's going to be a whole generation of parents that are going to have to learn the system that we're already in. And that's something that has come as a result of this pandemic. Yeah, I think just to echo that, I, and I think this is what everyone has really said, but um, it was certainly hard for our family to get through COVID as well. And it, absolutely, like Pana said, I did find it therapeutic when I was able to advocate and able to think systemically because at least it got me away from what we were dealing with or helped me feel like I, if I'm fighting for something, I'm going to make a difference for other people and the prioritization. I mean, I do think the inequality, to state the obvious, became so much more. It's always apparent. And I feel like it's a lot of what I do professionally is fight inequality in the educational system. Um, but it became really apparent that what's the expression that we were all in the same storm, but we weren't all in the same boat uh, that and I felt that personally, like as a parent organization where other people might not have other colleagues of mine may not have had the same situation. But then in speaking with, you know, families that were calling us for help, realizing how lucky I was and just how tough it was. And I really do hope one thing we can take away from that is to recognize that we have so we all have to navigate the same bureaucracies and to challenge the same systems and we may have similar needs but that we have to figure out a way to get the tools to everyone equally um i i couldn't agree more paula that it was so depressing to see everything just move 
online. I mean, hey, that worked great for me, but it did not work for so many parents. The people who needed it the most were completely cut out. And yeah, and and before, I mean, you take a tiny example. OPT used to always mail your route information. They didn't mail anything this year. Yeah. I mean, it was a disaster and it wasn't because of that, but it that didn't help. And so I think that uh, that's something that I, I, there's a lot of room for improvement in that and trying to make sure we're reaching everybody who needs help. I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Kim, about OPT, something so basic that we took for granted that we're going to get the gel of envelope in the mail. It was going to affect everybody. And the part that I'm concerned is like how we are normalizing the language, like send that email, it's on the website. Uh, let me drop the link. That that part concerns me so much because not everybody's going to be like tech savvy, right? And that's okay because right there is when we're thinking about the the really inclusion. Are we doing this in an uh, what is the equity, right? We can do that. It doesn't mean that we can't. Yes, we were doing it before. So why we're normalizing this new language around that it has to be technology? I I think that as an advocate, that's the part that I'm highly vigilant and being able to. Um, redirect the conversation about, hey, those are needs that we need to meet certain different ways. Um, Paula, could you just tell us, uh, you and, and Kim were referring to OPT. Could you just tell us what that is, please? <laughs> uh, it's Office of Pupil, Pupil Transportation. Transport. And it basically means, you know, for those of us who have school age kids, although I'm sure Ellie and I'm still getting, it's still getting picked up. Yeah. 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 Um, But it basically means, you know, how do you transport your child from your home to the school or wherever? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, So who's presently working with the council or an advocacy group? And uh, if you could share with us what you're working on, the delivery of services, individual or citywide or statewide, We'd love to hear from all of you. Call on me. Here we go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm the co-founder of NYC FAIR, which is Family Advocacy Information Resource. And um, the real elephant in the room, and it was prevalent before COVID, is the lack of staff. The la- I mean, the workforce isn't a shortage anymore. It isn't a crisis anymore. It's an emergency. Um, there just aren't enough people. And some of that has to do with minimum wage and, and our, our people, uh, our workers can earn the same amount of money working elsewhere, you know, Kmart, anywhere, um, and much more. And so why should they take on the, the, hard, the very difficult jobs of dealing with our children for less money? Um, So the advocacy efforts of New York City Fair and all the councils and anybody who wants to listen is to um, get more workers, you know, entice the DS people to work with our children. That goes for the teachers in the 853 schools and the um, 4410s. And um, it goes for everyone. And and pay parity is part of it. Mm -hmm. So it's... It's getting people to recognize that our children are worth working with and for, and that um, it is a, it can be a career. And then the second half of that is, you know, so recruitment and retention. The second half of that is trying to get more funding in the in the budget so that OPW and DOE can pay more. You know, so um, we have a new governor, we have a new opportunity, and it, I, it, I think it's everyone's responsibility to get out there and advocate for their child to get the services that they need. They, we need more money, we need more people, we need more, more, more. And our people, our kids and family members deserve the best quality of life they can have. And, the, the, you know, it doesn't matter if there's no, what services we want, if there's no one there to deliver them. And it's true, no matter how you access services, self-direction or traditional services, there just isn't anyone. 
Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I know Ellie, you and I have connected. And when I first was trying to understand all these things, I do self-direction and my dream would be create, which I haven't even like fully fleshed out yet, but it's to create an inclusive, integrated community that's self-sustainable, all these wonderful ideas, but it seems so far from reality. And then sometimes people are saying, oh, well, you know, put that in opposition to the residences. I don't see it in opposition any more than the same fact problem. that I don't have a para or a nurse right now is yeah. the same issue. Same it's issue. The jobs and the respect and truly the understanding of our community is not out there. And I feel like the established players in the field don't have the incentive to really, or they're just not, they don't seem to be moving the needle in the same way. Um, and so I feel like it's something where as parents and as, as a community, we need people to understand this in a way that I just think they don't right now. Um, and yeah. to understand you know, the value of these jobs and what a difference it can make and not just lip service, but money and respect and pay right. time off and, um, you know, I think trying to find a caregiver during COVID who I felt safe having in my house was close to impossible. My husband and I just split our schedules. We never had a day off. And that's how we paid the rent and took care of our son. But for lots of families, it was, you see the trickle down thing. My son's already gone through two paras in school. And what are we in the fourth week? And yeah. both of them left because of family caregiving responsibilities. And of course they did. I mean, given that, you know, it, it is, it is such a, bad balancing act right now um yeah there's no I, blame you're not you're yeah. not angry at them it's just no. they can't. i'm in the same boat if yeah. you know i'm like i'm only just one little step behind you know having to figure out what am i going to do if i can't do my job i think there's a trick here though knowing who who you're who to blame you know you don't blame the provider for not being able to give the services when they don't have the people to give the services when they don't have the money to uh, pay them, you know, so a lot of different levels. Yeah, understanding the bureaucracies, the, you know, how wages get determined, how benefits get determined, what actually, you know, self-direction is a whole other thing, but. Well, and the budget, line, budget just doesn't have enough money in it for us. Yeah. All right. Paula, did you have something you wanted to uh, share? I, I am doing something a little bit different and I want to framework this that when you're thinking about this level of advocacy, I, I want to be mindful that not everybody, especially people that are watching this recording, that uh, it's a privilege because many families have the nine to five jobs and you usually do your advocacy in your free time. And, and that's very limited for when you have a family that is so complex as all of us, right? So in my case, my advocacy is hyper focus related to my kids because I'm giving away my time, right? And when I started doing that, I was part of the early intervention coordinating council at the state level. And I did that for over 10 years. And actually I resigned from that literally a month ago. It was bittersweet, but I think it's time for the new generation for parents who have a more recent experience with early intervention to be there. They deserve to be there. They need you there. And, and, and I think that's, that's another way for me to share power, right? I think that's the, so important. We need to share power. We need to tell the other families that are coming behind us. Those are opportunities for you to create an impact the way that we already did it in our term. None of my two kids are eligible for services under the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities. In my job at Synergy and the Parent Center, we support the efforts that all the developmental disability planning councils are doing. Uh, we provide public testimony. We, we do all of that. Uh, our parent center is also part of the Arise Coalition that is focused specifically about issues related to special education in New York City. And in my personal time, I am doing uh, volunteer work with cultural organizations in New York City who are really doing a fantastic job creating inclusive spaces for disabled New Yorkers. And what I love about that job is that they're removing every single barrier in terms of uh, financial access, creating the space more inclusive, having diverse staff that are really going to be a reflection of the families that they want to bring. One outcome of this collaboration, for example, is with the Museum of Modern Art. We were able to work in a collaborative way, creating the sensory map. So that's an outcome. And that's something that, um, I think it taps into our interest and 
if I'm going to volunteer the additional hours, I, I am trying to do it in different areas that I think is going to serve not just one percentage, mm -hmm. but broader, right? Yep. Thank you. Pana, did you want to share something? You muted me. Hi, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know that several people have mentioned all the DD councils, the developmental disabilities councils. And as you know, and, and, and this is for the people watching, there's one in every borough. So that was kind of my way of, of, of starting out because I used to attend the ones for the Bronx. And right now I attend the ones for the children's um, committee and family um, committee for the Bronx. Um, and that's one way to kind of stay connected to what's going on. I, I'm, I'm on Ellie's email list. So I get all those blasts that go out, um, you know, one tomorrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, just staying in tune with what's going on, being able to advocate on a local level. Um, you know, I was just doing some research for school the other day, and I learned that one in four New Yorkers has one or more disabilities, right? Wow. So I saw that on the New York State Department of Health website. So that's a really, that's a lot of people. So people like, that's a huge demographic that has a lot of voting power, right? And we have to remember that the elected officials work for us because <laughs> I think sometimes they forget once they're getting office who they work for. And I agree with Ellie, we definitely need more money. I know that New York City, we have a lot of services, but you have to fight for it. And there's a lot of people that, that need those services. And we have a great opportunity right now. We're going to get a new mayor. We're going to get, a, we yes. have a new governor. We're going to get a new governor in 18 months or the same governor. We have, we're going to get a new OPWDD commissioner. Um, we, we have a shot at making a difference. Thank you. Mano, would you like to tell us what you're involved in now? I'm, uh, I'm working, I also work with QCDD, which is the Queens Council one. And just as Ellie was saying with the DSPs and the paras who work, uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to give my opinion about why the DSP should be paid. And I just gave it as, I thought giving like we do with everything related to us, my example was, let me relate a day in my life. And I told them how many times I put my son on the bed and in the chair before he takes the school bus, which was six times oh, wow. within one hour of feeding, bathing, dressing. And this is just a part of the job the DSP does. Why would any DSP want it at the lowest rate that you're paying them? You're not even giving them a Marshall's coupon or anything. OPWDD offers them nothing. If you're not going to pay them well, why are they going to come and work for our children, with our children or with our families? So the DSPs really need to be you know, paid. Then it's, it's really, really something that we need to fight for. Right, and again, would you just tell us what a DSP is, please? Uh, Direct support, support professional. professional. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. The word go <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, I just want to... to Yes, I just wanted to say thank you to each of you for your participation. This was just terrific. You had wonderful things to share with us, wonderful personal things. We appreciate that, uh, all the ad advocacy that you're doing. We all appreciate it. And Ellie, I will give you one, one, one more thing. And, but it goes, it goes to what everyone was saying about COVID and everything. The opportunity, be, anyone with electronic um, access, the opportunity to, to attend meetings is much better now than it ever has been. So that um, you, while you're, you know, in your workday, you, you take your lunch hour and you attend the the, D, the Developmental Disabilities Council's meetings, you know, and then, I mean, I'll plug myself, but the, our meetings are always in the evening, you know, so that working families can feed their kids and, you know, come on board. But um, it it's a blessing and, and uh, you know, and not. So what can I say? Right. Thank you. Well, certainly, if you'd like to learn more about advocacy, you can reach out to Family Connect. We will be providing information about the DD councils for each borough. 
um, resources such as ones that the ladies here have represented. And you can always just reach out to adaptcommunitynetwork.org. And again, I thank you all for this really enlightening and very informative advocacy panel. Thank you again. We thank our panelists for this, this extremely informative and lively discussion. Each of you has shared your individual and diverse journey to advocacy, but you have come together to state the importance of banding together as a community to invoke change through advocacy. To our audience, we hope that this presentation is an encouragement for you to become involved in a program, attend a disabilities council meeting, join a support group, contact a legislator, write a letter, attend a rally, and transition to advocacy. There are many paths that can lead to advocacy and there are no limitations or restrictions. You can be involved a little or a lot. The key factor to remember is that advocacy leads to change. Change will happen when there are many voices that are heard and the more voices, the better. The world is diverse and the special needs community is just as diverse, but we need to support each other and to advocate for the entire community. When we come together, we are a force that will be noticed and affect change for all. For more information on advocacy, please reach out to Family Connect, your borough disabilities council or your school district. For information or referral for supports and services, call 877-827-2666 or contact Project Connect at adaptcommunitynetwork.org. Thank you very much. <laughs>